On behalf of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee, seeing the presence of quorum, we're going to call this meeting to order at 6.03 p.m. Keep it pressed. Okay, sorry about that, getting used to the technology. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the Amherst uh, School Committee, seeing the presence of a quorum, calling this meeting to order also at 6.03 p.m. And on behalf of the Pelham School Committee, seeing presence of a quorum, I'll call this meeting to order at 6.03. So this is, um, uh, I think, a well-anticipated uh, meeting that the, the committees have been looking forward to a hearing. Uh, and I don't know if you want to provide an introduction, but um, we had both had, I think, some internal interest on the school committee and uh, within the district to do an audit of all our facilities, including uh, Amherst, Pelham, and the region. And uh, we have a report back and some information that we can share with the public. We also had, had obviously, uh, some substantial interest in the community to understand what facility challenges we have. And I think, obviously, with anticipation of seeing if in, in the future we can develop some sort of plan or strategy to knock down or remediate some of the barriers to accessibility that we have in our facilities. So with that, Superintendent, do you want to uh, introduce? Sure. Um, so I want to just uh, add to what the chair of the region said, which is that um, I think it's important to note that the, the origin of um, the interest um, of, of getting this report done really came from members, including the audience, of the CPAC. And so we just acknowledge this. I, want, I would like to acknowledge the C, uh, Special Ed Parent Advisory Council's uh, significant work in improving the outcomes and the operations of our district for a great many years. Um, and there were always questions about uh, ADA audit uh, or ADA access issues. There were kind of a lot of um, perspectives and thoughts, and I'm really glad, of their, glad for their advocacy to actually have a formal report by experts in the area that uh, we in the district can then use to plan next steps. Um, I also want to thank um, Fane Pierre-Louis, um, who is from KMA, who was on site to do just about all, if not all, I think. Um, the building is one of the things that I requested, uh, with all due respect to the other person I was connecting with, uh, with at, at your organization, was that really wanted to have someone who is literally in the buildings making kind of the presentations. So if there are questions uh, that were specific to any building, it's be uh, folks who are li literally here doing it, not uh, back at the office pulling their reports. So I really appreciate all of your, both of your work and you being here tonight uh, to share a presentation. I know there was, uh, the packets were thick uh, with the reports for each school and and uh, what, what you'll see tonight is sort of uh, a kind of condensed version of how to approach uh, ADA audits as well as um, kind of some individual next steps uh, or individual aspects of a school so that no matter what district you're in or what school you're looking at, you'll have kind of like a, uh, a mental map of how to make sense of what's in some complex detailed reports. Is that fair? Perfect. Okay, so I think with that, turn it over. Okay. So I am Stéphane Pierre-Louis from KMA. I'm an associate at Kessler-McGuinness and Associates. And this is Tejal. She's an architect at KMA. She works on both the compliance team and the design team. So KMA is an architecture and accessibility firm located in New End, Massachusetts. We provide public and private entities with consulting services related to accessibility and universal design. We've worked with many clients in the healthcare, multifamily housing, transportation, and education sectors. And this is a list of some of KMA's clients in these different sectors. So tonight we'll talk about the different laws and regulations that the Amherst Pelham Schools District must follow. Then I will explain, the, I will walk you through the process of auditing the buildings and the, collecting the data and putting it all together into a report. Then we will talk about the different um, issues that were, find, that were found throughout the schools, district-wide issues and school-specific issues. And then we will open the discussion to everyone so we can not only ask questions, but also share your personal experience or your children's personal experience navigating through the different buildings. Once um, this exchange is done, I'll, we'll take into consideration all, everything that we've heard tonight and then we'll report back, to, we'll update our reports into final reports, in, including all the experience we've heard tonight. The next step after that would be having discussions with the school committee or parents, students, anybody involved on how to move forward with the law and 
the best mitigations to make the schools more accessible. The Americans with Disabilities Act is based on the civil rights of 1964 and prohibits discrimination based on disability. As related to the Amherst Pelham Schools, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act covers non-discrimination in state and local government services. Because the Amherst Pelham Schools are a public entity that provides service, services, people with disabilities, might that be students, visitors, teachers, anybody who walk on the ground of the schools, must have an equal opportunity to participate in and benefit from the programs and activities offered at the school. Title II of the ADA also requires that anybody who has a disability, physical or cognitive disability, must be integrated to the maximum extent appropriate in the activities offered at the school. This would include classrooms, playgrounds, labs, gym, cafeteria, any rooms that are part of the school. It also has specific requirements for the safe operation of the programs or activities offered. Title II also requires the proper maintenance of accessible features throughout the building. This is mostly important for mechanical parts of the school, elevators, lifts, and the maintenance means not only making sure that they are able to be operated, but also the routes to them are safe and accessible and not used as storage spaces. The, Amer the Amherst Pelham District Schools must also follow the rules and regulations of the fi of 521 CMR. 521 CMR is a specialized code of of the, from the Massachusetts State Building Code that covers accessibility requirements as triggered by work, perform, or change of use. You might ask yourself, well, how do we figure out which areas of the school must be made accessible? You could, these, this question would be answered by, if you ask yourself these two questions, can the students access the classrooms or any rooms in the school or any extra curricular activities without finding barriers? Can they access the labs? Can they access the playgrounds? Or even the cafeterias? Because sometimes students participate in cooking classes. Can they access all these rooms without any barriers? Another question that you may ask yourself is, what about the public? Can the public access the school and any kind of public functions at the school without encountering any barriers? Title II of the ADA requires that each program, service, or activity, when viewed in its entirety, must be readily accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities. That means that, it doesn't mean that every single classroom and every single lab in the school must be made accessible, but it must be distributed throughout the school in, a, in the best way possible that would serve anybody with disabilities. That could be made either by architectural barrier removal or by operational changes, meaning either adding an elevator to provide access to the upper level classrooms or bringing some classroom to the first ground, making it accessible, of course, bringing the classrooms to the, to the ground level of the school to ensure that people can access it without having to go through stairs or inaccessible ramps or any upper level um, barriers. So we talked about 521 CMR, which is a specialized code of the Massachusetts Building Code. It is triggered by work perform or change of use. 521 CMR covers all areas open to the public, and the ADA covers not only areas open to the public, but also employees only areas. Another major difference between 521 CMR and the ADA is the fact that MAP 521 CMR applies to buildings, only applies to buildings where, it, so basically the language of the code says, if you touch anything in the building that exceed 30% of the estimated assessed value of the building, you have to make everything accessible. Whereas 521 CMR just requires proactive effort to keep making the building more and more accessible. 
The audits were conducted at the request of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District as part of a district-wide evaluation of the four elementary schools, the middle school, and the high school. The purpose of these audits was to identify all areas of the school that do not conform with the applicable state and federal accessibility requirements. There are two different types of audit. There are regular audits where we walk through a building and we just assess general barriers that do not comply with the code. And there are comprehensive audits, as we did for the Amherst Pelham schools, where we walk through every single classroom to make sure that we have an exact number of how many times the issues are repeated throughout the building. Once all this data is collected, we put it all into a report. We assess, the, we, the data collected is evaluated against 521 CMR and against the ADA. 521 CMR for all areas open to the public and the ADA for not only these areas but also employee only areas. I will show you the well, Wildwood, Wildwood sorry, Elementary Schools report as an example of how the data collected on site is communicated back to the schools in a report. We typically have a cover page with the name, address of the school, and a photograph, the date the audit was conducted, and the date the report was submitted back to the school. And then we have a very general introduction stating which KMA staff performed the audit, the purpose of the audit, a general description of the facility, and we go into a very brief description of the different codes that we are <coughs> auditing the building against. And then we have the scope of the audit, which is in relevance to the, the different areas we audited in the school. And then we have a summary of founding based on the building, building-wide issues toilet rooms, classrooms, et cetera. We have recently added this section for the Amherst Pelham District, which is what I was talking about earlier, where we will listen to the different feedbacks and questions that everybody has, and then we will develop this section with everything that we've heard with proposed mitigation based on what we've heard tonight. So the biggest Could I part- Could for one sure. quick second? So um, give you a chance to catch your breath as well before you keep rolling. So I think just to let the committees know that um, Dr. Brady, who's in the audience, organized a survey that went out to all staff and all families uh, to get their experiences as well uh, as it relates to accessibility and that was shared with, so, um, with our consultants. So in addition to the feedback that, that they'll get tonight, they've gotten or will get, I think have gotten, have gotten um, a pretty lengthy uh, list of commentary both from staff and from the community that'll be embedded in that category. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that the committee was aware of that. Okay, thank you. So what I would like to add to that is the fact that, so we went through the different, um, the feedbacks that we received and it, was, it felt great to see that a lot of the things that are in the packet that we received were also already flagged in our reports. So it's already in the report, but because it, is, it was raised as concerns, we can talk more about them tonight. <clears throat> so the major part of the report consists of a table listing all the issues we found in our audits of the schools. The second column is a description of the issues, along with the section of the code it does not comply with. The third column list standard proposed mitigation with a cost estimate and a quantity indicating the number of times the issue, these issues were flagged in the, on site or within the building itself. Once we state all the issues with the exterior, the site, the parking, the playgrounds, the curb ramps, the sidewalks, we go into the interior of the building and we talk about Basically, we try to navigate the building as a student or a parent or a visitor entering the building. What's wrong with the doors? Once you pass the doors, what's wrong with the corridors, the hallways? Are there protruding objects that would create hazard for somebody who has low vision? Are there visual alarms within the corridors? Are the coat hooks at a right reach range? Do the doors provide the proper maneuvering clearance for somebody who's using a wheelchair so they can get out of the swing of the door to operate the door? 
Once we get past the, the doors, the hallways, the protruding objects, we go into the classrooms and the offices themselves. In, on the other side of the doors, do the doors have maneuvering clearance? How are the sinks in the classrooms, the desks? Are the phones at, a, at, a, at the right reach range? Are there visual alarms in, in the classrooms? If there aren't visual alarms in the classroom, do they have these clear panels at the door so one can see the visual alarms from the hallway? The cafeterias, any special rooms? Once we pass these, we go into the toilet rooms. What's wrong with the toilet rooms? Are the mirror at the right height? Paper towel dispensers, urinal? Do the, do the toilet rooms provide an accessible store at least if we have five toilet rooms, do we have at least three that provide? We think about the percentage of the rooms within the building. So as you can see, we, na we, we flag all the issues we found in all the toilet rooms, but the, the, obliga the obligation is not to make every single toilet room accessible. It requires a strategic thinking to understand What's the scale of the school that I'm dealing with? How many, if I have two toilet rooms in the, on the ground floor, do I have to make both toilet rooms accessible based on their location within the building? If somebody's entering the back door, would it be okay for them to navigate throughout the entire building to access the front toilet room? It, it requires a lot of strategic thinking, but it does not require every single toilet room to be accessible. We also provide a floor plan of the, of the schools where we add numerical values that match the numbers of the table, just so we can understand how many times are the issues repeated throughout the floor plan. In how many issues do we have in the gym? How many issues do we have within a quad of classrooms? We also provide an aerial view of the, of the building, just so people can understand the issues that we found in the parking lot, on the, in the accessible routes from the parking lot to the entrance or to the playgrounds or within the back entrances. So now we can talk about the district-wide issues found basically within all six schools. The major issue we found within the school is the parking lots. The parking lots have excessive slopes within both the parking spaces and the access, the access aisles associated to them. This creates a hazard for anyone using a wheelchair. Another issue found in the, on the site of the schools are the site furniture, whereas they're either not located within an accessible route or the furniture itself is not accessible. We find that issue in the, the cafeteria tables, the picnic tables on the, near the playgrounds. And also, the playgrounds are not located within an accessible route. That means that it's either the, the route to the playground is not accessible or the route within the structures of the playground is not accessible. We can talk after about the different ways to make, the different percentage and the different ways to make not the entire playground accessible, but parts of it accessible. Another major issue we found throughout the schools are the, is the ground condition. The ground condition means it, it, it's either because of maintenance work, because if you think about it, we're in Massachusetts. There's snow, there's all those season, seasonal changes, which create changes of level, and it's a hazard for anybody using a cane, anybody who's lower vision and not even using a cane, or somebody in a wheelchair, or somebody pushing a stroller. It's a hazard for anyone, really. The sports, the sports fields are also not located in an accessible route. There are no accessible routes connecting the parking spaces to the sports field or the school, the buildings it's themselves to the, sport, to the sports fields. Also within the accessible routes, the major issues would be the curb ramps. Curb ramps are what connects the parking spaces or any kind of routes leading to the entrances of the building. If the curb ramps do not have the appropriate slope, somebody using a wheelchair has to, cannot access the, the entrance of the building without support from somebody. General build, building issues include the room signage. <coughs> Tactile or braille signage is required to be provided on the latch side of any doors in a building. 
Also, it is required to be located on the latch pull side of the door. Because if you think about it, if somebody is taking their time stopping at a door to touch the braille signage, they need to be outside the swing of the door in case somebody tries to open the door on the other side. Also, the door maneuvering clearance, as I mentioned earlier, this distance needs to be way bigger so somebody can get outside the swing of the door again to operate the door. Also, we found many protruding objects in the hallways <clears throat> and in the classrooms also. Protruding objects are a hazard for people who are low vision because they need to be mounted at a certain height where somebody using a cane can detect them and get outside of the way, basically. So they need to be either lower so the cane can detect it or higher above the required headroom. General classroom issues include the classroom sinks where they do not provide removable cabinets so somebody can roll underneath the sink and either use the soap dispenser or the, the knobs, the controls that are located sometimes along this wall. Also talking about protruding objects, this would be considered a protruding, a protruding object because if somebody was walking towards the sink in this way, they would hit this because it's not low enough for a cane to detect it and it's not high enough for them to avoid it. Also other protruding objects include the phones, which for the phones we found different issues where not only are they protruding objects, but they are also located too high where the controls are not within the reach range of somebody sitting in a chair. Some classrooms also have desks that are not accessible, meaning either the, <clears throat> the apron under the desk is too low for somebody using a wheelchair, or the width between the legs of the desk is not wide enough for somebody to be able to walk to row underneath it. General toilet rooms issues include the mirrors that are too high for somebody using a wheelchair. The pipes underneath the sink are not insulating, meaning if somebody rolls underneath, they might burn themselves. And there are various protruding objects within the, the toilet rooms. Also, the grab bars configurations are usually wrong within the toilet rooms, and the toilet paper dispensers are often mounted above the grab bar. This creates a problem for somebody who's really depending on the grabber for support. The paper toilet dispenser would create uh, an obstruction to that. Also, there are lacks of there's there's a lack of accessible urinals, both for somebody using a wheelchair, and also for people who who cannot stand straight straighten their back to use a, a, a urinal. School-specific issues. In both Fourth River and Wildwood Elementary Schools, who, these are the two schools that had very similar, a very similar layout. So we found similar issues in both these schools, especially in the library where the story time or show and tell area is not located within an accessible route. So if a child had a story to tell, when everybody can use this area, if a child using a wheelchair or any kind of mobility device, they would have to stay outside of the centered area to present their, their story. Also, the quads within the Fort River and the Wildwood Elementary Schools, none of the, the quads have accessible bathrooms. When I say accessible bathrooms, they do not have the proper signage at the door. They have all the previous previous issues that we mentioned for the mirrors, the sinks, the protruding objects, and none of them have an accessible stall. So any children in this in these classrooms would have to exit the classroom and use the toilet room that's within the, next to the computer lab, if I remember correctly. Also at Fort River and Wildwood Elementary Schools, we found that the central courtyard are not made accessible. At the Wildwood School, they added a temporary ramp, which is in itself not accessible because it has a steeper slope than required by the code, and it also does not have handrails on both sides. At the Crocker Farm Elementary School, we found that the, the stage is 
only accessible via a lift that's not located within the, the auditorium itself. If you think about it again, if somebody had to access the, if somebody using a wheelchair or somebody who couldn't lift their legs had to access the stage, they would have to leave the room, go down the hallway, back to the back room, then access the stage, which is considered discriminatory. Also, the central courtyards at the Crocker Farm Elementary Schools are not accessible. You would think that this material, which is a soft, um, recycled rubber material is accessible in itself, but because of, I would say, lack of maintenance and also because it's in an open environment, maybe rain or snow have, has affected it throughout time, but the connection between the different modules create abrupt change of levels. Also, the other central courtyard lacks total, doesn't have an accessible road to it. The issues we found at the Amherst Regional Middle School, some of them are similar to the other ones, but the very unique issue was the elevator car size, which was smaller than what is required by the code. Also, we found that drinking fountains, which are not only protruding objects, but the code requires that if you provide drinking fountains, you must provide high and low drinking fountains, which would help anybody using a wheelchair or anybody who can't bend to use a lowered <coughs> drinking fountain, sorry. Also in the auditorium, we found that the route from the designated accessible seating area to the stage has excessive slopes, and the stage itself is accessible via stairs, unless you use the lift in the back room. At the Amherst Regional High School, we also found that the parking lacks accessible configuration, especially next to the sports field where not only are the signs not located at the head of the parking spaces, but also they lack access IO, which means if somebody was to park here, they would have to unload in the vehicular way, which is unsafe. Also, the pool is not located on an accessible route, just like any of the other sports field. At the Amherst Regional High School, we found different ramps throughout the building that are not compliant. They either lack handrails on both sides of the ramps, or they have excessive slopes, or if they have the handrails on both sides, they don't have the required extension of the ramp. So somebody who's Use, following the ramp as their handrail as, as they go up the ramp, they know when, they're, when they reach the level landing because that's when the ramp levels up and it's called the extension of the ramp. <clears throat> so now I'm going to open the discussion to everyone just so I can hear your personal experience with the school or your children's experience with the school and incorporate it in our report so we can update the drafts that we submitted into final report. And then KMA can either help you in creating a priority list on how to make the, not, ev not making everything accessible, but what's, what to be made accessible based on the children's, um, needs or based on what the code would require as first, second, and third priority. Also, once that's done, KMA provides architectural services, which means not only would we help you understand how to prioritize, but we could help you in making architectural schemes on how to make some classrooms, rather than be in their layout or in their architectural boundaries, more accessible. Thank you. Just want to start by thanking you again for such a comprehensive report. Um, and, and the school committee members have all received the relevant full reports for the schools in their three districts. I'm not going to bore you with our governance uh, model, but uh, it's not worth the time. But that there's people who are sitting on different committees, but we sort of function in this way as one district, because uh, all three districts share a vision statement and a mission statement that are dedicated to all students. Um, 
So um, before we open up for school committee questions, I actually want to acknowledge that our uh, facilities coordinator who is starting tomorrow took a couple hours early start and Rupert Roy Clark decided to come given the content so that uh, he could hear it directly from the consultant. So thank you, Rupert, for being here. I really appreciate it and welcome. Um, he will be a key member of the team um, taking next steps on it. So rather than watching a video or anything like that, we wanted to, we asked him and he agreed to be here in person to hear the report. Wonderful. So we have uh, in the layout of the room conveniently, um, we have Amherst this way, the, which is the Amherst Elementary Committee. Uh, and we have Pelham over here. And then um, a whole bunch of us are also in the regional that deals with the middle school and the high school. And I just wanted to open this up I mean, I, hopefully the committee members have had a chance to look through the report. Um, I know I received actually a copy that went through every, all the schools. I'm assuming all the other committee members did as well. Yes. Um, so <laughs> if, uh, if you have questions or comments, I thought we should open it up for that now. Yes, what do we know. What do we have to do first? You mean physically? <coughs> so, as I said earlier, we've, we've flagged everything that we found in the report. Everything is in the report, but everything does not have to be made accessible. So what you have to, be, to do next is, I'm not sure what the process is if you take the reports to a municipality and talk about budgeting and scoping, but what you would have to do next is understand what, what are the needs in the school? What, what are the areas that are critical at the school that the students cannot access? What are the areas that are critical at the school that the public cannot access? From there, you would have to create a priority, priority list or based on whatever scope of budgeting you have, understand, okay, what has to come first from there? you can move on with renovations and architectural work. Why don't we uh, take questions from the committee or comments before we talk about those next kind of next steps, unless you wanted to get into that. I had questions and, Great. and Wonderful. comments. So. <laughs> um, so thank you both uh, for being here tonight and also for your very detailed presentation. It was really, actually really helpful. And I um, had looked through the um, information, the report that was sent uh, via email, as Dr. Morris mentioned, um, and had a couple of questions and comments. Um, <clears throat> one, I found that th there were a couple areas of the reports that were particularly troubling for me that you mentioned tonight. Uh, in particular, I think the lack of accessibility to playgrounds and sports fields mm -hmm. um, across all the schools uh, seems to be a real barrier for, you know, for students to be able to participate uh, in recess and to be able to just get outside and enjoy time with, you know, with friends and everything. So I, I think that that is actually a real um, serious issue that's been raised previously by our community. Um, but it was good to hear, or not good, but at least, you know, affirming right. to hear in this report. Um, I also realized that looking through this, that there were quite a few things that were pointed out in those charts that you helpfully added at the end that are either little cost or even no cost um, that mm -hmm. can be, you know, can help mitigate some of these effects, right? And so I think, you know, my, my question there is, um, in your work with other districts and communities, have you found that addressing things like that um, can be helpful in terms of, you know, helping the district prioritize projects, right? So as you're dealing and thinking through the impact on budgets, if you can put together a punch list of items that can be taken care of pretty quickly and easily, mm -hmm. you know, does, is it helpful to do something like that first mm -hmm. and then move on to uh, maybe, you know, higher budget items? Mm -hmm. Or is it more useful to have a comprehensive plan to deal with everything simultaneously. I, I guess I'm looking to you, you know, both of you for, for that kind of guidance mm -hmm. uh, for the committee. And then finally, the only other comment that I had was just around the cost for a lot of these things. I think looking at you know, the, the elementary schools in particular, uh, because that's our purview for this chair, for, for my chair in this, in this committee, um, you know, I mean, I think no school was under $140,000 for the elementary schools. Um, and you know, a couple of these schools, I think, are very clearly in, in rough shape. Um, but honestly, I think all three of them, all three elementary schools, the Crocker Farm, Wildwood, and Fort River here in Amherst, uh, clearly need help. And so um, I would love any 
further thoughts that you might have on you know how to deal with some of those issues as well. Thank you. So to address the priority question, what KMA has done is the, in the past is we've added a column right here that says priority, and we've had we've, we usually suggest let's say we have a range from one to five, what should be addressed right away and what can wait a little longer. When we add this column at the end, let's say we say, okay, you have seven accessible parking spaces. Let's make one accessible for now. Let's regrade one parking for now. That would be number five, because it would be number five, and then we would explain that. You don't have to make all of them accessible, but if you have one, based on how the number of parking you have, that would be fine. Once we submit these numbers from one to five, then you would take these numbers to your financial team or discuss, to discuss budget. You would take all the fives that we've numbered and you would, you would try to understand within all these fives, which ones can we, which one, which ones can we afford to mitigate right away? Once you've decided on that, you could share that with us and we would let you, we would make you, we would help you understand if these, those different fives that you've chosen, would that be enough to comply, to comply with the code? Does that make sense? Yeah. And um, when it comes to the cost, just as a general background of the cost, KMA came up with these numbers. We've done a very big project with Beth Israel, and we worked with an estimator on, who worked on different ADA projects, and we came up with these numbers based on the different work that we've done with him and with other estimators. These numbers are general ballpark of what it would cost to fix these issues. And again, the, rep the total report, the total cost of this report is very high because this is a comprehensive audit. We are flagging every single issue that we, find, we found in the building. But again, not all of them need to be made accessible. So if we agree on adding the last column, one to five, if you think about the different fives that you would pick, it would make that number drop considerably. As long as we can have a mutual understanding on what can be affordable by the school and what can meet the law at the same time. Spitzer. Um, first, I'd just like to echo the thanks. You know, it, this is really wonderful to have actually taken this step and, and done this audit. Um, I. I'm wondering just, you know, and this may be taking us a little off track, but we're about to hopefully in, in the near future replace um, some of our elementary schools. And this audit has really highlighted, um, I think, another reason why it's important for us to, to make that step forward. But um, one of the things I'm thinking is Amherst is a community that often prides itself in accessibility. And, um, you know, obviously we, we, we have fallen far short of that um, and we have a long ways to go as we move forward. What I'm wondering is, um, this has laid out all of the guidelines that have to do with the law. But for example, you know, our town has just adopted net zero bylaws, you know, and we clearly want to go above and beyond what's needed to make a green building. For example, um, if we were to go want to go above and beyond potentially with our new schools and make a truly, you know, accessible building that maybe goes beyond what's required by the law, do you have any recommendations on how we could do that, or what, where we would even want to start to look? Um, as we move forward, just because it seems like, given everything you've shown us, it, it would be good to be proactive because it seems like we're always learning more about ways to uh, make our buildings more accessible. Thanks. Okay. So what I would suggest is, so I can explain the process um, that KMA usually goes through when dealing with towns or schools with ADA projects. Let's say you have an architect who's working on a brand new school who submitted drawings, early drawing, early schematic drawings of the school. If you already have an architect in-house, you would submit the drawings to KMA or any accessibility consulting firm where we do something called plan reviews. It's where we have the drawings in front of us and we, just like I explained, we do the audit. We literally walk through the floor plans 
as if we were using a wheelchair or low vision and we're flagging every single thing in the drawings that do not, that do not comply with the ADA or 521 CMR or the state or federal local building code. Once this is done, we submit the marked up drawings with a report. Not only do we cloud barriers in the drawings them, themselves, but we also write a report with numbers just like this that match the clouds that are in the drawings and we submit to the architect. These marked up, markups drawings are changed into design development. Once that other step is taken, they send the drawings back to us for the same process. And we, we follow the drawings all the way through building permit submittal, where we stamp the drawings and we, we give you the guarantee that everything is accessible within the drawings. Then once construction is done, or during construction, we do something called post-construction audits, where we come with the drawings that we marked up, where we said everything in those drawings is accessible. We come with these drawings that are perfectly accessible, and we walk through the built, the, the building, and make sure that everything that we flagged that was wrong in the previous set is not repeated in the construction, or there are no construction tolerant errors within the building itself. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is something that you can do with any accessibility framework here. Now, if you don't have an, an architecture or an architecture firm or an architect in-house to do the drawings for you. We've worked a lot with the MSBA. So they usually have architects in-house in that send the drawings to us. So this is another step that you can take, reaching out to them if you don't have an architect in-house. But at the end of the day, the drawings must go through an accessibility consulting firm to make sure that they are ADA okay. Please. I guess my second question was just trying to get at whether or not there is a level above ADA compliance yes, that yes. is I'll, kind of a gold standard um, for accessibility. Yes, so when we do these, these ADA work, there's something called best practice, which goes beyond ADA, but best practice is, is usually done when you are in touch with the people using the building. Because if you don't know what they need, you can't meet their need. You're just going by the letter of the code. And the code is very black and white. But sometimes somebody might need, for example, if you think about a door that's not compliant, you can add a paddle next to it and somebody can use that door. But it doesn't make the door compliant. It makes the door accessible, which is not something that, that the code would say. The code would say, make the door bigger so somebody can use it. But you can also just make, use a paddle and the door opens by itself and the person using the wheelchair does not even have to interact with the door. So these things are called best practice. They go beyond the, the code. I can't say that it's something that you would find in any building code, but it's something that you would find in understanding who will be using the building. And just like we're doing, hearing feedbacks, what do people need? How can we help? And that's how you do best practice and go beyond the AD or 521 CMR. You know, one of the things that um, a couple of years ago, I got familiar with an organization in Boston. Uh, I think it was called the Institute for Human Centered Design. IHDD. Yeah, and what I found, it shouldn't be revolutionary, but it was revolutionary to me anyway, was designing furniture, designing spaces, um, designing you know, tools that you use uh, in a way that have a universal design mm -hmm. that um, is aesthetically pleasing. I think because this was actually like professional designers, they made everything look really nice, like mm -hmm. it's from Ikea. Um, but, but, the, but the philosophy behind it, I really liked because as you're describing best practices, the, the design of the classrooms, the design of the bathrooms, the design of the, like the kitchen or counter spaces were intentionally designed in a way that somebody could have a spectrum of mobility, a spectrum of, of abilities, sight, anything else, mm -hmm. um, height, whatever it is, and find the functionality um, uh, universal. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and the reason I say that is because so often when we're doing designs and mitigations, 
the, and this is something they were talking about when I was meeting with Valerie Fletcher there, that, it, that what you do is you design something, you know, because you have somebody who has a particular accessibility challenge, you then sort of tear out the room and you put in things that, you know, mark out the fact that this is for somebody who has a mobility challenge, mm -hmm. right? And if you start from the beginning with a new school or a new space, it'd be interesting to me if, there's a, if there are examples of schools that have designed from the beginning mm -hmm. spaces that feel completely welcoming, completely functional. Because what really struck me, and this is an awful thing to say, but what struck me from reading through the report, which really bothered me, and it's why it'd be great to prioritize how to knock some of these things down, was that in so many cases, these buildings were designed with, with those students and those staff members who might have mo mobility challenges or visual impairments mm -hmm. um, as if they didn't even exist. It wasn't even so much that they were jury rigged or set to the side. It's as if the schools were designed in such a way that the people who had come into them couldn't possibly have um, those mobility challenges or whatever it is or circumstances. And it, 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 it strikes me that it would be desirable to think about facilities in which we could flip that model and say, imagine facilities in which, you know, every, everything you go into is accessible. But I, I, I mentioned that comment just because it was brought up, and, and to me it's something that I think would be a great goal, and just to add one last comment, because then I'll finish my comments, is I, when prioritization, what I would also love to see in the near term is when we're doing routine maintenance or furniture acquisition and things like that, how can we take the existing budget we already have, where we're gonna be spending money anyway, and use it in a way in which we're just replacing it with desks or tables or chairs or other things that allow for um, starting to meet some of these, these needs. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mr. Demling and Ms. Dahl. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll echo very everybody's thanks for, for, your, for your work in the report. Um, so yeah, so my main question is, is, is probably for the superintendent, so you can you know, wait to the end and um, address this, but it's really about the, the process that we take for prioritization, I mean, knowing that we don't have infinite money, right? And so how do we go about adding that prioritization column? And, you know, one piece, you know, is, is getting the, the knowledge and the background experience and the consultants. Another piece, though, I think is, is really trying to leverage as much as we can the the lived experience of our key stakeholders. And when I think about the key stakeholders in, in this situation, it's, it's our students with disabilities, it's their families, their aides, and uh, their teachers, uh, both current and past, because these are the real people that have lived through this, right, and have the specific uh, feedback uh, for each of those buildings in terms of what, what's going to benefit them the most. Because, you know, the thing that I was struck through as I was going through all the line items in the report is that was very objective and very, you know, to, to the letter of the, um, of, of the code, but I had a real hard time I, being able to identify to any degree, oh, this would have a huge return on investment. This would have a real value add to someone's experience. Um, because I, I think what we were probably in the situation of is we know we have a finite budget, and so how can we, you know, in this year make the most, um, uh, progress on that and then and then going forward so I know that you know we talked about a general survey uh, I'd be interested to hear how we focus in on those key stakeholders and that that lived experience uh, what he said <laughs> no literally <laughs> I'm like nodding in, in violent agreement but, um, because I literally was going to say almost exactly the same words about um, prioritizing based on lived experience and getting the most return particularly um, given that Hopefully, our um, two of our many buildings will have a very short life. So, um, and I, I'm curious. So, it's actually also a question of clarification. Um, when you say that you're going to um, integrate the public feedback um, that you've received, um, is that going to be informing the prioritization, or is that or is your prioritization more just your expert um, advice, and then we separately would go through that process of prioritizing based on our own community's lived experience and priorities. Okay, so as I said earlier, a lot of the things that I'm hearing or that I've seen in the survey have already been flagged in our reports. So it would be just adding the column and 
based on how many, how, how many times I've heard it, how I understand it affecting the accessibility of the school, that would affect the number that it gets. But also if there's something that we missed or if there's something that from talking to you is new to us, it would not only be adding, added to the, the table, but also be taken into consideration based on how important is it not only to the school, but does it meet the, the would it help the, the school meet the, the code's requirements? So it would be both. And also I wanted to address your comment. Um, it's funny when you think about, well, a lot of people, when you think about accessibility, it's usually a last minute thing. It's a ramp that's slapped to the facade of a building. It's a lift added to, to the backside of, of our school. There's really no smart answer to, well, how do you do this? It's, do you care enough to understand that this is not an add-on? This is integrated design. This is universal design. It comes with the building. It comes with whoever's using the building. Not even people using a wheelchair. A pregnant lady, anyone push, pushing a stroller, somebody who, in, a, in any student using maybe the gym and who's hurt themselves playing basketball. They're gonna be disabled for a couple of days. How do they access the building? It's thinking about that. It's not thinking, well, we just need to meet the code. Let's just put a, a ramp in the facade of the building. It's let's make sure every single detail, the desks in the classrooms are accessible. The height of the chalkboard is accessible. Any, every single detail. And it's not something that you can open a book and read about. It's within whoever is designing the building. And that's, that's the best answer I could come up with. There's no smart, wise decision that somebody could come up with. It's just, do you care enough to understand that you cannot draw or build a building and not think about every, anyone who would be using the building? Everyone. What I want to make sure we do is make sure that if there are other members of any of the committees who wanted to ask questions or make comments, that they have an opportunity to do so. And then I assume the superintendent had thoughts on next steps or other comments he wanted to make. Is there anything? Then proceed. So um, I think a couple things. One is that I think we, we've enjoyed our relationship you know with the team that's worked with us and we would want to get to that prioritization place as, as people have spoken about it um i think on a larger scale i think um i say this well so i'd want to integrate this topic within our capital discussions we have one tonight at the amp for the amher school committee meeting and so uh the way i view it is that this shouldn't be somehow separate from the capital discussions actually should be part and parcel of the capital discussions that I think the more we keep uh, the information we receive from this audit to be its own topic the less likely it is it's going to be seen as in like the secondary capital discussion and I don't think that's actually consistent with the whole approach that we're trying to take um, so that's the way I'd like to see those conversations go we'll have capital discussions in all three districts you know um, in the near future some like an hour from now and another's a little later than that um, I do think also that we have to, the prioritization is important because we want to plan for the future. So, you know, at the Amherst School Committee, for instance, we kind of proposed a five-year capital plan. We'll go over that with some, some thoughts tonight. And that we want to plan for what's the most, you know, someone used the phrase, you know, what do you get the most return on investment for? So that we want to think about that. Um, I think the challenge with, with that analogy or that phrase in this is that we don't know who our students and staff will be. And so the students who, uh, and staff who we have are going to be different than the uh, their needs are going to be different than the students that are coming. So um, I think the, the community value, it's not to say that the community feedback isn't valuable, and it's incredibly valuable, but when we think about our preschoolers and their needs, we want to be planful in the same way that was described you know, before they get here, uh, not to be reactive. And I think perhaps my final comment is uh, it's painful to read these reports. So I think as much as you know, everyone is rightfully acknowledging and thanking you for your work, um, no one should feel great leaving the meeting tonight about what we'd read. It's, it's, it's quite humbling to realize um, in a formal document, it, it's, it's making formal what has been less formal, which is the lived experience of staff members and students for 
dozens of years in all of our buildings at every level. And so uh, that doesn't feel good, it shouldn't feel good. Um, so I think the, the only, it's also frustrating to be reactive instead of proactive, right? So uh, I could list a couple of things we've done over the last five years in the district to make our build, that would have showed up on the list um, that, that didn't, which is good, but uh, we haven't taken this step uh, before. So I think we need to take forward moving steps now that we have this information to make um, these buildings, which to Mr. Nakajima's point, I agree, they were not designed with everybody in mind. They were designed with people who had a lot of um, characteristics uh, that are shared by significant members of our population, but not everyone. Um, that wasn't how the buildings were designed. So retrofitting is not as good as design, and I appreciate Ms. Spitzer's question around that, um, but that's what we have, so that's what we'll do. Um, so, you know, Mr. Roy Clark's got challenges in front of him, uh, this being one of them, but I uh, appreciate him being here tonight, and I think the reason I encouraged him to come was that this is a high priority for the district, is we, we've got multiple facilities issues, there could be a different consultant looking at something else that would tell us something about our facilities, but we prioritize this one to bring tonight, um, and we, what we would do is come back to you with some prioritization, working with, with our team, um, and then figuring out how that fits within a capital, capital budget, not just for next year, but for multiple years moving forward. Thank you, Superintendent, and thanks to KMA Thank very you. much for your report. Um, the great thing about it is, is that uh, thanks to the advocacy in the community, and members of CPAC, and the committees themselves, um, we have taken the first step. And so people should keep us honest in where we are on this, but um, I don't have any question that this is going to be an active topic in everything we're doing. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you. And we're unbelievably running a uh, half a minute ahead, uh, which I think has never, it must be the harmonic convergence of having the three committees together. So with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank we'll you. move to the um, item three on our agenda, which is adjournment of Pelham and Amherst. And on the Amherst side, uh, I'll take a motion. Thank you. <laughs> On the Amherst side, I'll take a motion. Move to adjourn. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Thank you. We are adjourned. Mr. Denley? And seeing the presence of a quorum, I will call this meeting of Union 26 to order. And I will just briefly mention for the, those of you following along that Union 26, uh, that does not meet frequently, is the superintendency union uh, shared between the Amherst District uh, Elementary District and the Pelham Elementary District. That's the organizational structure that allows us to share central office personnel and services, such as the superintendent, finance director, um, and so is called to order when we discuss matters involving those personnel and services, such as tonight. And, that, and so, uh, so it's a six-person committee, three from Amherst, three, three from Pelham. Uh, so it's myself, Ms. Ordonez, Ms. McDonald, and from Pelham, the members are Ms. Kastensen, Mr. I'm sorry. <laughs> if, raise your hand if you are from Pelham and a member of Union 26. Okay, so Mr. Menino, and then could you introduce, introduce yourselves? Um, Jessica Jean-Louis. Sarah Hall. Rob Menino. Great. Uh, you, you, your next order of business. Uh, and, okay, and so uh, the next order of business is to discuss the potential shift in the role of the finance director, which is a shared oh, right. item We're not going to between the region yeah, and Union 26. That's why I was deferring to you, dude, Mr. Chair. Dude, that is so, you know what's funny? This is such a formal setting. Normally, there are lots of like dudes and yeah, man, in our regular setting. So I'm like, I feel a little uptight tonight, you know? I gotta chill out. Uh, that's wonderful. So what? We're buttoned up. Yeah, but not, don't chill out too much, right? Just like, <laughs> find that happy medium. Uh, terrific. Uh, so, uh, Superintendent, would you like to, so uh, hopefully everyone's had a chance to review a uh, memorandum uh, on this subject around the uh, finance director and a potential ro additional role for him at the town of Amherst. And I uh, hope you'd be willing to introduce the topic. Sure, so, um, and I wanna thank the town manager for being here tonight. So he's here if there's questions that are relevant, uh, he, he's here to answer them. So thank you for being here. Um, about two months ago, um, Mr. Bachman and I, uh, he engaged me in a conversation knowing that um, there's some significant capital projects being thought about and potentially planned for the town of Amherst. And that uh, our finance director, Sean Mangano, has, a particularly has many strengths, but one of them um, is ability to take complex sets of information, share them in a, in a very accessible manner with 
large diverse groups of stakeholders and also has a strength of understanding complex interrelationships between projects. Uh, and I think uh, those of you in all three committees, or in this case two committees, have seen Mr. Mangano's work on that way and that it might fill a need uh, for the town of Amherst to have Sean spending some time, excuse me, Mr. Mangano spending some time working for the town, which you, you think, you, uh, my predict you could have easily predict my reaction is like, yeah, right, no way. You, you know, I'm keeping him busy enough. And um, so we then engaged in, in more conversation about how that could work. How could, how could Mr. Mangano spend some time working for the town of Amherst? What would that look like? And how could the district be compensated in, in response? And, and to be very frank, uh, there's a financial element to it, but that wasn't my main primary concern. My primary concern was about the work. And um, knowing that many of our committees are looking at some procurements that are significant starting in the summer, uh, all three have capital projects. Uh, procurement, I would think it's fair to say for Mr. Mangano is not his favorite part of his job. Um, it's incredibly time consuming and Mr. Delaney who works for the town might disagree but not, not necessarily what um, Mr. Mangano uh, would enjoy in terms of being intellectual stimulation in the role. So uh, we talked about that and we talked about how it could perhaps work to take some work off Mr. Mangano's plate because we knew this was coming, if this was approved, they would have come, a uh, significant amount would come on. I think it's also worth noting that Mr. Bachman and I had pretty extensive conversations about making sure that conflict of interest between multiple employers was dealt with and that um, if Mr. Mangano if for this role would be working for the town of Amherst, well, there's, there's more than one town represented around this table and in these bodies. And one could imagine conflict, and I think the thing that made me feel comfortable is really Mr. Mangano's work would be on the communication and technical side, not in terms of advancing a project or making recommendations. That would be the town manager's role uh, for the town of Amherst, not Mr. Mangano's role. His, no, his role would be to, to run numbers and create visuals to support whatever it is the town manager is proposing. So uh, we then engaged Mr. Mangano in um, the planning so that his opinion and his thoughts were taken into account. Uh, we talked about seeing how this goes. So you could notice in the memorandum that it's uh, to be evaluated by September 1st of this current um, calendar year uh, because we, we're, where we don't know exactly how, how this will go. It might work swimmingly where it's a relationship that we want to extend. Uh, it might not work as smoothly and we might say it was worth a try and you know now after six, seven months, we're realizing that the workload's not 10 or 15% of Mr. Mangano's time, it's significantly more, or on the town side, they may say, no, we have new staff coming in that we think can manage this. There's a whole number of variables that we don't know, but um, I came to the conclusion after talking to Mr. Mangano and Mr. Bachelman that this, in my opinion, would be worth recommending to have about an eight-month trial period, see how this goes, uh, come back in the summer to give a report to the committees so that you can then evaluate um, based on my recommendation, but you know, you can evaluate based on a whole number of things, whether this is a relationship that we want to extend more temporarily uh, or even beyond, and the town would likely want to do the same thing on their side as well. Um, so we want to just uh, at least bring this up for discussion, and um, certainly Mr. Mangano came as well in case there's questions that you have for him that he'd like to, you'd like to hear him answer as well. Great, thank you very much. Are there questions from the committees? Mr. Dunling. Uh, yeah, a couple, couple for Mr. Mangano if he's uh, available. Yes. So, so Sean, you are a tremendously valuable resource to our districts. Thank I, you. I think anybody who's served on any of these committees for any length of time notices that. And um, so, you know, the first, my first reaction when I read this was. Well, is Sean happy with it? <laughs> so, uh, one, I just want to know, if you hear from you personally, how you feel about it in terms of your, your personal career development and just your job satisfaction. Um, and then, two, just professionally, when you look at the details of the, the time sharing and how it's worked out, do you feel like uh, in your role as finance director, you would still be able to adequately service all the districts that you're mm -hmm. required to? So I'm very satisfied with the job to date. Um, so um, it is a new challenge, but... Um, you know, I viewed it as a, a need of the town, and I like to fill needs or help. Um, so that's sort of how I approached it. Um, in terms of workload, I think it's sort of unknown. That's why I'll be very, you know, open with Mike about or Dr. Morris um, about you know how it's going. 
Um, you know, I have two young kids, a lot of stuff going on in the district, and that's going to be sort of the first priority. Um, so that's why I think it's good that we're doing it as a trial period to see how it goes. Um, but again, I think it's a need. I'll try, you know, I'm going to do my best um, to provide the data that can help facilitate a process that can move the town forward. Um, as Mike mentioned, it's not going to be making recommendations. It's going to be providing information the way, you know, I do hopefully all the time. Um, and yeah, I, I'm happy to give it a try. So um, I will say that I was, um, I think I had sort of the same reaction that Mr. Dumling had, uh, just wondering how you felt about it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It's, you know, reassuring, I think, to hear that you've thought about this, of course, um, in your sort of signature style. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen I've, and worked with you, you know, quite a bit, both in union negotiations and other um, aspects of the work for the district and school committee, uh, and definitely appreciate how much of a commitment that is in time and energy. Um, I also recognize that you know the uh, district office, the central office, is short in staff, and that it, that's also impacted the business office um, over which you preside. And so, I, I have to say that I am kind of concerned about this. Uh, not kind of. I'm very concerned, actually. Um, and I am also worried about uh, you know conflict of interest. I appreciate uh, Dr. Morris's review of some of the steps that would be taken. But I want to acknowledge publicly that I think um, there is a lot of information that our finance director um, is privy to, uh, you know, with bids and things like that, that could potentially cause some real, you know, conflict of interest um, in in respect to one one of those towns uh, getting more information than others, and you know, so I, I I don't want to raise alarms where there shouldn't be alarms. Um, but it, there's something really not sitting very well with me with this, you know, this idea and this proposal. Um, I'm open, you know, to changing my mind and, and thinking about it more. And I appreciate again your honesty and you know, in thinking about all this. Um, but I am, I am very much concerned about that. And I also think, um, you know, having a procurement officer or someone in charge of procurement only, in my mind, ameliorates a little bit of the the workload. Um, again, seeing all the different things that you're involved with, um, I think it's probably fine, you know, in the short term when we don't have things like union negotiations, but as soon as there, something comes up that sends that workload or tips it over the balance, um, I think very quickly this becomes a bad idea. So, um, you know, in my interest is in maintaining, keeping you around for as long as we can, Mr. Mangano, uh, but also maintaining the stability of the, of the district and making sure that, you know, the really good staff are well taken care of and have as long, you know, careers as they possibly can there. So, anyway, that's just, I just wanted to share my thinking right now. Um, I just want to be sure I understand with um, regard to the sharing of the town of Amherst procurement <coughs> officer with the district. Um, because in terms of Pelham, we're um, using the services of the finance director not as part of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District, but because of we sh you know share the superintendent. So would that person then be offering those services to Pelham to sort of in lieu of Sean, basically? Is that, Mr. Mangano, is that how that works technically? <laughs> I would still do the Pelham elementary portion. Um, the regional portion, which also benefits Pelham, would be the procurement official. So I just have two quick questions. Um, one is I noticed like tonight is the finance committee meeting of the town council, and we're also having our meeting, and you often, I assume, would attend the town council finance meeting. So um, one thing is just, some concern over scheduling of these types of meetings. It's a lot, um, as somebody who attends a lot of these evening meetings, we have a limited number of evenings and I'm sure your services will be needed at more than um, the number right now. And then my other question was just whether or not the town of Amherst is gonna to continue to look for a full-time finance director because it seems like 10 or 15% of one person um, wouldn't be enough to do all of the the work that's needed um, for the town, and if that's true that they're continuing to work, would this be something that might phase out if they find somebody who has the skill set that they're looking for? And that may be a question more for the town manager, so. Um, 
Thank you. Um, so we are continuing to look for a finance director for the town um, and looking at various configurations. As you can imagine, um, oh, first off, thank you for even considering this to the, to the committee, the regional committee and the union. Um, so as you can imagine, replacing someone of the caliber of Sandy Pooler and, uh, is really hard, and I think we have to be adjusting our sights in some ways. Um, but um, in fact, I interviewed someone today um, for, for that role. The, um, I think that Mr. Mangano brings a unique set of skills as the superintendent identified. He's already ramped up on all the major capital projects. Half of the projects that we're talking about already are in the school district. Uh, he has familiarity with all the players um, and um, I think there's no startup time and he has incredible credibility as you all recognize. Um, I think Mr. Uh, Morris, Dr. Morris and I, neither of us know exactly how this is gonna play out. That's why we wanna try it as a pilot and see how it works. And if we get someone with a different skill set, um, then we will look at this again in the future. Um, but it, the sort of criticality of the time is, is what's, what's important right now because there are gonna be decisions being made in the relatively near future. Um, you mentioned going to finance committee meetings. I think most of the, the concentration of effort is gonna be with joint capital planning committee, uh, which meets typically during the daytime or it has in the past, and I assume it will continue to be that way. That's okay. uh, thank you very much, and I appreciate you bringing it to the committee. Uh, and actually, it's funny, when I first read this, uh, my reaction was, was, I had some similar thoughts to my colleagues, but my first thought was, I wasn't remotely surprised that the town, uh, given my experience with you, Mr. Mangano, said, what a spectacular talent, we'd love to have access to it to try to work through some of our challenges on, on doing capital planning. Um, so I compliment you on Thank that. you. I think it a, represents um, an acknowledgement of your skills and accomplishments um, within the district. I think what I would love to see if we end up doing this is well before September, uh, I'd love to see uh, at least a meeting with the, the chairs of Union 26 and the, and the region to get an update on how it's going so that we have some sort of intermediate <laughs> review on what issues are coming up, what adjustments. I could be more people than that. I'm just saying at a, at a minimum, I'd want some sort of uh, interim view on the part of the committees to update us on how things are proceeding well in advance of September 1st. Um, one of the things that, uh, it may sound funny because it probably sounds overly abstract, apart from some of the issues of, I think, a literal conflict of interest, it's part of the thing for me is that with a new town council and some changes in the structure in Amherst, one of the challenges we have are trying to sort of articulate and understand the legal lines of accountability and authority that we have in the different functions we have in our region. And so one of the challenges I think we have is that the, at the elementary level in Amherst, on one level the schools are a department of the town and are fully integrated within the town. On another level, there are hired, there, the, some key actors are hired and answerable to a committee that's independently elected and has, um, by statute, other, other lines of, of responsibility and accountability um, for the committee. And at the regional level, obviously, it gets even more complicated than that because you have more, more than one town that's involved in terms of the funding decisions, in terms of the um, electoral accountability, in terms of the decision making. And so w when even though it, it in so many respects makes perfect sense to try to do this, I'm just flagging the fact that even as a long-term relationship, the, the more you, one sorts of inadvertently blurs the, the lines of um, reporting, uh, the, the more potential you have for misunderstanding. And I think that's particularly true if you have one set of committees or uh, administrative officers and leaders who understand what we're doing now, uh, if it were a different set in five or 10 years, um, then you could, you could run into other challenges from it. And, and, and so to me, in addition to sort of literally the functional areas of trying to work through how does this work, um, in, a, in a practical matter in terms of information and decision making, um, part of me also just thinks about uh, trying to have as much elegance and transparency around what are we doing, who's doing what, and who are they responsible to? Um, and, and the less blurring of that, I think, the better off for everyone, and particularly in a startup mode, 
where, where I think, and I don't mean this as, at all, sitting where I'm sitting right now, particularly in this lovely august room, um, I don't mean this in any way as a dis disrespect to the current town council, but I think when you had a select board, for example, that had been functioning m multiple years with the same folks and a lot of the same core practices, I might have more easily said for eight months, let's go with it, because you kind of knew all the stakeholders and the Joint Capital Planning Committee had worked on a regular basis, you know, it's almost as a machine of itself, trying to go through a lot of these um, decisions. So. Uh, the other thing, too, and I guess this has already been said, but uh, this is where I'm sensitive to your workload, Mr. Mm -hmm. Magana. I'd also say on some level, if you're volunteering for it, it's your funeral, sure. um, at least for eight <laughs> months. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm not trying to be flippant. I'm just saying is that is the, the, the interesting question is how much does uh, Mr. Delaney's work, which I'm sure would be substantial, functionally offset? And I don't, I don't know if you can answer me now any better mm -hmm. I think it was something we're going to do. We're just going to have to find out, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully it'll it'll be helpful. I'm sure it'll be helpful in many ways, anyway. Um, but uh, it's just it's more food for thought in terms of anything. But um, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Mr. Dunley. Yeah. So I, I would echo uh, Mr. Nakajima's comments that you know, well before September, if if this were to go ahead, we would want to get together to to assess how it's going. Um, you know, and, and I guess to address, cause, because like Mr. Nakajima points out, there are structural unknowns. We've never dealt with the town council and other, other avenues. And, and uh, to, to echo some of Mr. Donius's comments, you know, there are other unknowns. You know, the essential problem here to see if we can overcome is, you know, we, we don't know how it's going to go. And we don't, and the committees don't want to put our districts in a position where all of a sudden we have major financial director resource need that is not av available, right? And so, um, um, so, you know, so two, two thoughts. One is, I think it would be kind of incumbent uh, upon Mr. Mangano to, that if he's agreeing, you know, to a specific number of hours, that that's a hard cap. You know, there's, um, it's not, you're not an exempt employee where you just work through the weekends and every hour and you're missing your kids' birthdays, you know, it's, it's a hard cap number of hours. Um, that's one. And two is, I'm wondering if, if there might be some adjustment to this terminate the agreement on 90 days notice. That seems like a bit of a long time with this kind of a change. So um, maybe the town manager could comment on if, if he would be comfortable with, with a significantly lower number than that, and that would maybe make the committee feel more comfortable that if, if it became uh, unwieldy um, for the districts, that might be you know, a, a quicker out clause. Yeah, I, th I think the idea on that was that um, the committee or the superintendent or I or Mr. Mangano could all have a ripcord. We could pull at any point to say this is really just going south on us pretty quickly. 90 days, if that's not the right number, happy to talk about a different time frame for that. That's not a big deal. Great. So um, I have a funny, do you have any, any other comments? I got a funny question. Were you looking for some sort of vote or some sort of action immediately right now? I know there's also another discussion to occur in executive session. Yeah, so, Superintendent. Um, no, so I was trying to follow the typical, and I should have prefaced this at the beginning, this typical school committee protocol that for anything, you know, any change or any vote that would be the significant that would be discussed uh, as has just been or may continue, um, deliberate it on and then come back to a future meeting for a vote. I think the, there's some timeliness from the town end, I think, for, I understand from Mr. Bockelman, uh, just given the number of capital projects that we're getting into JCPC season as it is. Um, but I didn't think it'd be fair to ask the committee for a vote tonight. I understand. I, it, the reason I was asking, apart from the fact that we hadn't talked about it, which is a really <laughs> good reason, um, is uh, th because of the timeliness. I mean, I think, if I remember correctly, we were already in the JCPC this time last year, like well into. Uh, okay. So if, if that is it for this discussion, we'll move forward on the agenda. We appreciate uh, your time. And uh, now I will look to Mr. Demler. Okay, as uh, Union 26 Chair, I will move that we enter executive session in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Purpose 2, to conduct negotiations with non-union personnel with no plan to return to open session. Second. Thank you. And uh, as we are entering executive session, if I understand correctly, it's a roll call vote. And so uh, Demling, aye. McDonald, aye. Ordonez. Ordonez, aye. 
Menino I. Menino I. Paul I. Jean Louis I. Thank you. We are adjourned. Okay. And for the regional committee, uh, I move that we enter executive session in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 38, Purpose 2, to conduct negotiations with the non union personnel, uh, in particular Mr. Mangana, with no plan to return to open session. Is there a second? A second. Thanks. We moved and seconded. Uh, so I'll start at that end of the committee and please vote. Demling, aye. Spitzer, aye. McDonald, aye. Ordonez, aye. Nakajima, aye. Menino, aye. 